Well, great to have you all here watching online. We appreciate you watching and following along with us. Uh, we're going to be in the book of Philippians, chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, want to turn there, it'll all be on the screen, or you can follow along on the bottom of the screen. If you're watching from home, that's where all the scripture will be in every place we're going to follow. So I told you we're taking two weeks to talk about being grateful uh, because, you know, we just like miss this at times. This would just, it's just not built into us. This is something we have to learn. It's something we have to figure out together and really encourage one another to do. So we're going to do that through the eyes of Paul. That's what we're going to do. So last week, it was almost like it was Paul's thankful list. This is what I'm thankful for. This is what I'm grateful for. And it ends with him just absolute worship, uh, talking about the eternal God, because that's where he was going. That's what he saw. This morning, I really want to talk about the secret ingredient of gratefulness. There, there, there's this ingredient that you trip across in Paul's writings, especially in Philippians. And, and you got to understand where he's at to understand this. Because if, if you're sitting in prison, and, and you're there because you're doing the right thing, you're trying to uh, get the gospel everywhere, but the problem is when you're asked, is it God or Caesar, and you're choosing God, that's a problem. You know, the emperor doesn't like that, and you get thrown into jail for those things. That's where Paul finds himself. He finds himself in jail for the gospel, and I'm sure he's thinking, my goodness, how did I end up here? I, I didn't see my life going in this direction. Yes, Jesus, whatever you want me to do, I, I didn't see it sitting in jail. But there's a reason why Philippians is so different, and, and it's so different from somebody writing in jail. And I think it's because we're going to trip across this word he's going to give us that is just not built into us. It is something he's going to tell us we have to learn in order to see it be present in our life. It's just something that is not there, but if we can learn it together, and if we can ask Jesus to help us understand it and cultivate it in our life, I think it's a secret ingredient for us to actually live a grateful life and be grateful for all the things that God has given to us. So Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 14 is, is where we're going to look at this this morning. Uh, and again, follow along. Open up your Bibles. Here's what Paul writes for us. I have great joy in the Lord because now at last you have again expressed your concern for me. Now I know you were concerned before, but you had no opportunity to do anything. So this church has an opportunity to bless Paul, and Paul is so thankful that they have this opportunity to do that. I am not saying this because I am in need. For I have learned to be, and here's our word, content in any circumstance. In any circumstance, I have learned to be content. Those are going to be the words we're going to just zero in on this morning. In any circumstances, I've experienced times of need, Paul says. I've experienced times of abundance where it just kept coming in and I just had more than I need. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of contentment. Whether I go satisfied or I am hungry, whether I have plenty or I have nothing, I am able to do all things through him, through Christ, the one who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you did well to share with me in my troubles. There's Paul talking about this secret sitting in prison saying I've had all these times where it's been great and I haven't been in prison for the gospel and there's been times I'm sitting here and I've learned this idea of contentment I've learned this idea of contentment. now I'm going to tell you why this is so hard okay because nobody tells you to be content when's the last time your cell phone company didn't add and said hey I know you got the iPhone 14 love it just love it, okay? Embrace it. No, they tell you what? Your iPhone 14 is terrible. It's awful. You need the iPhone 16. What are you doing with that old phone? We are constantly pushed that way all the time. In all our advertising, in all this what I call consumer economy, you, you need the latest. You need the latest and the best all the time. And we're pushed that way constantly. We're not only just pushed that way in the things that we buy, the advertising we're watching. We're also pushed that way in the sports world, okay? I know many of you are Chiefs fans, okay? Can you tell me what would happen? The Chiefs win the Super Bowl. The next year, they're 
And you're going, oh, what's wrong with my team, right? And they have a press conference. Andy Reid, what's going on? We're just content, you know? We got the trophy. We don't need anything else. And you're screaming at the TV at Andy Reid, right? Medic Packard Holmes goes, nah, I got enough MVPs, right? That would never work. It's a new year. What do you got? I got to win it again. The one trophy is not enough. I need two. Two is not enough. I need three, right? It's just built into us. Nobody does that. No team after Super Bowl goes, we're all done now. We're, 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 we've made it, okay? All our fans, you can be happy now. We'll never win again. You, you, you would lose it, okay? You would lose it. And you see this all the time. Nobody's happy. Nobody's content for what we have. We always want more in almost every place you look. It's not hardwired into us. We always want more. When I was a kid, and I've told you this before because I'm old, it was the Sears wish book, okay? That, that silly catalog, but when it showed up, gosh, you wanted everything in it. Nobody, look, nobody looked at it and just said, I'm good, mom and dad, I'm, I'm good, I'm good, N- okay? What if your kids did that, okay? It's your birthday, what do you want? No, I'm good, okay? You, you never hear that. Why? Because we're always pushed to want the next thing. I need this, I need this, I need this. And sometimes we'll use that word need. We're all just pushed in this direction constantly. We're all pushed in this direction. We've almost defined success that way. I need to go higher, need to do more, get more, get more, obtain more, gather more. That if this is the secret to gratefulness, this is why it's so hard. You don't see it anywhere. None of us are told to do this. It's not hardwired into us. In fact, just the opposite is. More, 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 more. So I want to acknowledge off the bat, this is hard. This is hard. This is difficult. This is challenging. Because maybe if we understand it that way, we're going to understand more what Paul's saying that he learned when it comes to this thing called contentment. So here we go. Contentment, as I said, it must be learned. You're not, you're, you're not born learning how to be content. You're born wanting more. And finding out ways to express that, getting more, okay? And this learned, just so you understand, I want to make sure we understood what the Greek means. It's gaining fact knowledge as someone learns from experience. See, both are in there, okay? I have to learn about this thing, what it looks like, but I also have to experience it. That contentment isn't good just knowing facts about it. Okay, to be content, I got to do these three things. It's I have to experience it. I have to go through experiences where I learn how to be content in those situations. And through experiences, I'm not just gaining knowledge about how to be content. I'm actually learning hands-on in those circumstances what it means to be content. So it's both. I have to know about contentment, and then I have to experience it hands-on to know what it's like and what it's like to live that way and what it's like to have contentment in my life so that I can be grateful, okay? So in other words, you have experiences where you learn to depend on God's provision. Now, I'm going to show you this from Scripture. You have experiences where you learn to depend on on God's provision, that God is going to provide for me, that God is going to give me lots of blessings. Paul laid out a bunch of them last week that we learned about. But now, I'm going to have experiences with God. Much like we talked that David did, that when David got to the the scene where Goliath was there, it's not that he just walked in and said, I can take that guy, what's wrong with the rest of you? It's that he had experiences with God where there was an enemy, There was a lion and a bear. Both were bigger than him, okay? And he had to go, what am I supposed to do? I'm supposed to to guard and protect the sheep. And he always knew that God would provide for him. So there he goes. He kills the lion, he kills the bear, and he just looks at Goliath and goes, well, he's just like one of them. He's an enemy. God's on my side, and I'm going to defeat him. Okay? It's not that he just walked into that camp arrogant little David thinking I can take him on. It's that he had experiences with God, so he was ready for that moment. So 
Same thing. We're going to have experiences with God where we learn to depend on God's provision. So, let's look at Abraham. Abraham in Genesis 22. This is where he is uh, told to go sacrifice his son Isaac. He names that place the Lord will provide. This is Genesis 22, 14. Some of you know it as the official like Hebrew name we, we lay out there. It's Jehovah Jireh. The Lord will provide. Okay, Abraham didn't get up one day and God said, okay, challenge. We're going to take your son. Okay, he had all these experience with God before Genesis 22. Before Genesis 22 is, is Abraham, leave, leave your father's house. Leave your father's house. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to take you to a new place. It was Abraham, look up at the stars because I'm going to provide that many descendants for you. This is a man with no kids. Okay, in his 90s, thinking, this is not when you have kids. This is not when it works. And yet, because he's got this history with God that God has provided over and over again, it comes to, okay, well, I guess at 100 years old, I'm going to be a dad. Okay, that, that's, that, that's what he just believed. And God provided his son, Isaac. So when he gets to this point, he's already had these experience with God where he knows that God can provide for him. So he gets to this point, and the writer of Hebrews says, Abraham believed if he went through with it, that God was just going to raise him from the dead, raise Isaac from the dead. Okay, that is how confident he is in the provider that God is. That God's going to provide, that God's going to provide, that God's going to provide. That's how confident he is. It's, yep, yep. Well, then, it, then if we got to go through with this, he's just going to raise him from the dead because God provided him as a son and he watched as God provided over and over and over again his entire life. So he had experiences with God where he learned to lean into God's provision that God would provide and take care of him. You know this happened to the Israelites in the wilderness. The whole point of going into the wilderness to head to Canaan if you've ever looked at that map and thought, there are quicker ways to do this, okay? What is God trying to do? God is trying to teach them contentment, okay? This is all through Exodus 16 when they leave and they begin to head to Canaan. That God is trying to get them to understand, I'm going to provide for you, okay? I, mean, I know this is hard, this is difficult. You don't think that what you need is in the desert. Don't worry. <laughs> He's like, don't worry, I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to make sure you have everything that you need. And the constant battle that you read about in the books of Exodus is just God's people going, I don't know, can we trust God? Can we trust God? In fact, when he's giving the second law, Deuteronomy, okay, that's what Deuteronomy means, the second giving of the law, look what it says. So he humbled you. Who does that? God does that. He's trying to teach him contentment. So he humbled you by making you hungry and then feeding you with unfamiliar manna, right? They're like, I, I don't know, but no grocery store in Egypt carried manna. What is this thing, okay? That, that's what you read. They're grumbling. They don't know what it is. And then they're like, really, this? This is what you provide for us? Yep, I'm going to provide for you. And it's not going to look like you think it's going to look. They're like, aren't you just going to give us everything we had in Egypt? No. I'm going to give you something different. I'm going to give you something new. And it's going to be better than you thought. So he feeds you with unfamiliar men. He did this to teach you what? Humankind cannot live by bread alone, but also by everything that comes from the Lord's mouth. This is Deuteronomy 8.3. He's trying to teach them what? Contentment. He's trying to teach them, trust God. He is going to provide for you. He's going to provide for you. I know you came in this morning, and, and, and there are probably all sorts of different needs, people watching different needs that you have, and you're like, oh, I don't know what this is going to look like. I don't know what God's going to do. And God does amazing things. He always does, okay? He always does. That's the way God works. That's the way God works. Now, we were kind of joking this week because, you know, for, for Jill and I, we met in college, so our assumption is, we're just going to send Stephen to Bible college, he's going to come back married. That's the way it goes, right? And that's not the way it went, because that wasn't God's plan. And sometimes you go, well, 
Okay, that didn't work. We're going to send them to seminary. Okay, that's even better. I I'm joking. Okay, we really didn't do that for that purpose. But you understand that's what you're thinking. Well, that's what you expect. Except God has something better in plan and you watch it, and so we get to rejoice Saturday in what God did at putting two people together, okay? Was it anything like we thought? No, it was not. We think it's going to happen here, it's going to be here, and, well, now he's moved, maybe it's there, right? We have no idea, but God has a plan through all of it, and all he wants us to do is depend on him. He's like, would you just trust me? Yeah, but I don't get it. Just trust me. Yeah, but I thought I had it all figured out. Yeah, I know you did. Just trust me. Please, trust me. By the way, this is the same scripture that Jesus uses. He's led into the wilderness for 40 days to fast after his baptism, and he is confronted by Satan himself. And the first thing he says is, 40 days? <laughs> You're hungry. You're hungry. You're the son of God. See that stone? Make it bread. Come on, I know you can do it. I know you can do it. And what was Jesus' answer to him? It's the same thing that God was trying to teach his people. Man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of God. Depend on me. Trust in me. I'm going to provide for you. Don't worry about it. Now, if this sounds hard, it is. I'm just going to tell you, it's hard. This isn't easy. This is hard. This is why there's this verse coming up, okay? To remind us we don't do it on our own strength. Here's the problem with this verse. This verse gets written on athlete's shoes. They're eye black. I mean, it's just that people in the stands holding up Philippians 4.13. Philippians 4.13, you're going to win today. Philippians 4.13. It's what we do. And unfortunately, as I told you, it's, it's when we pull verses out... We, we tend, they just lose their, their meaning. And we think, oh, all right, it's on the bottom of my shoe. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be great in the NBA, okay? And I, I don't mean to demean any of these athletes who are doing it. I'm just trying to get you to understand, okay? This is not a verse you do that. When you understand it in context about I got to learn how to be content, and this is going to take more than me, you now know why he writes, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That's why he writes it. Because he knows this is hard. This is hard. This is hard at times when you have no idea how God is going to provide and you're going, oh, I don't, I don't know. God, this doesn't look very good. This doesn't look, I have no idea what you're doing here, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It has so less to do with all the athletes and all the people who, who frame that and put it on their walls and more to do with how am I going to learn how to be content and trust that God is going to provide for me. That's going to take some strength that I don't have. But guess who does have it? Jesus has it, and he wants to give it to me so I can learn this whole thing about being content and being grateful. That is so much more powerful than... And we just got to be careful about this. Pulling verses out, using them for all sorts of stuff. When Paul's saying, my goodness, God gave me everything I need. He gave me all the strength I need to learn how to be content. One more promise. And it's outside of this. I know I went to verse 19, but I love this verse. Man, we, we need this verse. P Paul, Paul writes this out of, I was in need, God provided, I was in need, God provided, and my God will supply some, every. I love it. I love it. He's not like, well, God came through most of the time. I mean, his batting average was pretty good, so I guess I'm just going to go with that. Now, he came through every time. Now, Paul would say, it wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I had no idea what God was doing there. Okay, so, so let me give you an example. Paul grows up, and he learns how to be a tent maker. That is his skill. That is his trade. But I have no idea what he thought that was going to be or what it was going to look like, but that's what he did when he went into every town. That's what he did. Went to Ephesus. He set up in the Agora, which is the marketplace, and he started making tents. Wait a minute. Didn't he? Yep. Yep. 
And when he wasn't making tents and selling them the Agora, he was in the synagogues and he was in the lecture hall of Tyrannus, as we're told, told, preaching and teaching and proclaiming the good news. I'm sure when he was doing that, he had no idea that he was going to be all over the place making tents. Okay? And that so often God, in so many different ways, provided every single thing that he needed. As he's going out, as he's proclaiming the gospel, God just kept meeting his needs. Oh, I need this. God meets it. I need this. There's God again doing it over and over and over again. Because this is a great promise. My God, Paul says, will supply every need. This is written by a man sitting in prison saying God has a plan and a purpose in all of it. And he is at work. So let me end with this this morning. I want you to think, what is it that you would have carried in here this morning and you would say, it's what I really need in my life? It could be concerning your work. I know work is, it's, right, we, we hit seasons and times where, uh, where employers just start downsizing and doing different things and costs go up, so they're trying to cut out. Maybe that's you, and maybe you already know that's coming, and it's coming up soon, and you have no idea, and you're like, I don't know what I'm going to do. That would be your need. So my question then would be, are you trusting in Christ to provide that for you? Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's fine. So I got, I got these things coming up because our bills, isn't that, isn't that crazy? They just all tend to go up. They don't go down. They just go up, right? They just tend to go up. And a lot of times that just makes things at times very stressful. And we're like, God, how are you going to provide for this? Are you trusting in Christ to provide that for you? Might be in your marriage. Might be tension right now in your marriage. And you wonder what Jesus is going to do. Uh, through that, you have no idea what's coming next, and you're going to just trust in Jesus to provide for you. It could be all sorts of different things. I probably could run through a bunch of different uh, scenarios of things you might be going through, experiencing, where you would say, I really need this. I really need this. And my question would just be, are you trusting in Christ to provide that for you. That's the secret of contentment. I'm going to trust Jesus to provide the things that I need. Contentment in, in the Greek just meant I have enough. I have enough. And the way Paul used it, because he didn't use it very often, it was Christ has given me enough. So we don't do that very often, do we? But this season is a great season to remember Christ has given me enough. And he's always come through, and I can trust in him to come through next. And so I, I just want you uh, to, to bow your heads and close your eyes right now. And that would be my question. What do you need? And then I want you to take these few moments of silence, and I want you to tell Jesus what you need. And that you would trust that he would provide for what you need. So do that right now if you would. Jesus, on this day, I have no idea how many have walked in, how many will watch this and lift up the need they have to you. Father, forgive us because quite often 
We're, we're sitting there figuring out how to take care of our need. And when we exhaust all options, boy, then it's time to pray. Then it's time to pray. But Father, I believe Paul here is teaching us something quite different. Quite different. He's trying to teach us to pray first. He's helping us understand that you just want us to have these experience with you where you provide for us. We depend upon you and provide. It just builds this trust in our life of all that you, all of you have done. So that's why, Father, he could sit in prison and be grateful and be content because you provided every need for him. So I pray that, Father, around the room for those who have, who have watched this, that this is an opportunity to maybe if we've never done it before, to start trusting that you provide. Father, forgive us. We've lost kind of that in our, in our, in our day and age. Where, where we look to ourselves and we forget what a good, good father you are in providing for all our needs. And we've just wrongly assumed that everything we had was because of ourselves. Perhaps today is a day to really reset things in our lives and get back to understanding that you desire to provide for us and that you will supply every need. And we thank you for that. So I pray, Father, we would start something new. We would learn what it is to be content by having these experiences where you provide for us. And the first one can be today as we've shared our need with you. We ask you to work in great and awesome ways, Father, as only you can. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.